Every day in our country, 200 people on average will die from overdose. When it comes to criminal justice and drug policy, I know that we're not doing the best that we can. We say often that you can't arrest your way out of this problem. We turn around and do exactly the opposite. We have to kind of understand our present and our past and then uh, compare it to what could be. I've heard and I've read a great deal about what has been going on in Portugal for the last 20 years and I wanted to actually see it for myself. Portugal had the equivalent of a massive heroin opioid crisis over 20 years ago and they've largely contained it. Almost everyone in Portugal in the 90s had a family member or a friend or someone they knew that, was, that had a drug, a drug consumption problem. You will see people inject in a way that um, it was really shocking and you don't see that anymore. What advice would you give to us if we were going to try to slowly start moving, what are some things you, you think we should be talking about? The punishment is not work. The criminalization works. A new generation of prosecutors can be very useful uh, in changing their mindset. For us, it's fairly easy to do our job when we have a problematic user because we are also part of the Ministry of Health. If I want to refer a drug addict from the Dissuasion Commission to a treatment center under the Ministry of Health, I can do it with one phone call. After the criminalization, the police forces really have a tool that it really works, sending people to specialize the help it really can make the difference at the end of the day. At least they have the same, con the, the first contact, they have the, they know a face, they know someone, they have uh, a door open. And if it is not immediately, they will, they will, most of them. Although we have a general goal that it would be good for patients not to relapse. We keep on helping him because it is better for him to keep on messing up and to keep on coming here than to be left behind. Portugal is a place that for two decades has recognized that responding in a way that tries to address and eliminate the stigma will encourage people into treatment and better enable us to save lives. We are not promoting drug use. Drug use is already there. People are using drugs. This is the, the reality. Our focus is on preventing um, cases of overdose. If we are there in that moment, it's an opportunity to do something. So the reason why they're successful is because they've earned the trust of the population. The decriminalization did allow a new perspective. The change that people using drugs were not criminals, but they are people. The biggest takeaway in Portugal uh, is that we should clearly take on matters related to drug use and drug abuse from a healthcare perspective, not a criminal justice perspective. When you look at our own experience, the public resources that go towards incarceration, the prosecution, the emergency room services, so the political will is there today to begin to be bold and start a serious conversation around this area. We've been waging an ineffective war on drugs. And FJP hopes that our country joins other parts of the world to recognize that substance use is a public health issue that can't be solved with a criminal justice solution. Too far often we think we know everything as Americans. I know I don't have universal health care. I know I don't, I don't have, have a lot of the resources, resources but, but I can't take, take back man and take, take back compassion.
Hello, and welcome to the first of a two-part series on the role of prosecutors in drug decriminalization and promoting public health. My name is Keshia Naidu, and I'm the Managing Director of Legal Affairs um, at the Drug Policy Alliance, the, the nation's leading drug policy reform organization, fighting to end the war on drugs and to advance policies grounded in compassion, science, health, and human rights. Drug Policy Alliance is thrilled to be hosting the series in collaboration with the Bloomberg American Health Initiative at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, Fair and Just Prosecution, and the Institute for Innovation in Prosecution at John Jay College. A special thank you to the Bloomberg American Health Initiative at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health for the funding to make this panel series possible. And thank you to On Point for producing today's panel and my colleague, Sheila Vakaria from our Department of Research and Academic Engagement for putting this series together. Um, I'd like to give you some background and context before jumping into the substance of the session. This last week, we celebrated the one year anniversary of drug decriminalization taking effect in Oregon. The groundbreaking ballot initiative made Oregon the first state in the nation to decriminalize personal possession of all drugs and greatly expand access to health services. DPA crafted the policy model and drug policy action, our 501c advocacy arm spearheaded the campaign and the measure passed overwhelmingly by Oregon voters um, in November of 2020 in the election back then. Reducing arrests and increasing access to services helps ensure that people are no longer saddled with the lifelong consequences of drug arrest, such as the denial of housing, employment, public health, public benefits, and more. We know from decades of failed policies that criminalization only worsens health outcomes. And what we need instead is for people to access the support they need without the criminal legal system being a gatekeeper for services. So Oregon was the first decriminalization policy to be enacted um, and it was still a ballot measure, but that's not the only way, or I should say that's one way to advance policy change and promote a public health approach to drug use. Even in the absence of legislative action at the state level, there are ways that officials at the local level, including prosecutors, can promote a health approach to drug use. Prosecutors are powerful actors in the criminal legal system. With over 2,000 officers across the country, prosecutors have the ability to affect the lives of millions of people. They have broad powers and discretionary authority at every stage of a criminal process. They determine what charges should be filed, which charges to bring against the defendant, whether to oppose pretrial relief, and what sentences to recommend. And historically, prosecutors have won elections by promoting tough on crime policies. And this success has been evaluated by the number of convictions or how long somebody may be incarcerated. Um, and this has contributed to the mass incarcer incarceration crisis that we have in the United States. But in the past few years, we've seen a number of non-traditional prosecutors elected in jurisdictions across the US. These prosecutors ran on platforms of reforming the system. And since taking office, have adopted policies that aim to reduce the footprint of the criminal legal system. Various policies have been adopted and implemented in localities across the country. And today's webinar will showcase policies in two jurisdictions. So to give you a quick roadmap of the session, um, we have Baltimore State's attorney, Marilyn Mosby, um, who will kick off the conversation. And she will talk about an experience of non-prosecution and other of, of drug and other offenses in Baltimore. Um, thereafter, we'll have a presentation by Dr. Susan Sherman uh, and Dr. Anna Harvey about their recent research on various public safety and public health outcomes of policy changes in Baltimore and Suffolk County, Massachusetts. 
Our final speaker, Miriam Quincy, will discuss the broader implications of this approach, of this approach in jurisdictions across the country. Speaker bios are available through the webinar link provided separately. Uh, I'm not going to read through the bios, but I encourage you to check them out. Um, and then after the presentations, there will be time for audience questions. So please enter your questions in the chat box or in the Q&A box, and we'll do our best to get through as many as possible. So without further ado, I will now turn it over to Marilyn Mosby. Thank you. I am so incredibly honored to be here. I would just start with, in 2019, I testified before the US House panel and said, there's no better illumination of this country's failed war on drugs than the city of Baltimore, Maryland. And while I said that in the context of marijuana legalization, it applies to drug policy more generally. Since the era of Nixon, then Reagan, we have fought a war on drugs, which was later professed by Nixon's aide, John Ehrlichman, was really a war on black people. He professed that there were two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. Quote, quote unquote, we knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or being black, but by getting the public to associate hippies with marijuana and the blacks with heroin and then criminalizing them both heavily, we could disrupt their communities, we could arrest their leaders, we could raid their homes, we could break up their meetings, we could vilify them night after night on evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. And, and that's exactly what they did. And so you look at a city like mine where it's almost 70% black, the population in Baltimore City, 28% of Baltimore's population lived in poverty, 35% of children live below poverty. There are over 18,000 vacant houses, 16,000 vacant lots. The unemployment rate for young African-American men between the ages of 18 and 24, which is twice that of, of whites. We saw communities of color decimated by the war on drugs and the targeting and the prosecution and the excessive sentences imposed mostly on people of color contributed to the cyclical crime driven by the collateral consequences of those convictions. So you have children that lost their parents to a system. We exacerbated poverty and most strikingly, we did nothing, absolutely nothing to reduce drugs. And yet we as a country have continued by default and I had the awesome opportunity of being able to, to go to Portugal and to Germany and, and to see the way that it should work. But we as a country, we continue by default to do the same thing over and over again, which is to stigmatize and to criminalize mostly people of color for what should be and what should have always been a public health crisis and a public health issue. So even before the pandemic, having gone to Portugal and Germany, my office was working to end the, the, the drug war in, in the city of Baltimore. And in March of 2020, we underwent somewhat of an experiment with the criminal justice system. We consulted with public health experts at the best and the brightest in the world at Johns Hopkins University to slow the spread of COVID in prisons and in jails. And we decided to stop prosecuting a number of offenses that we believed in theory had nothing to do with public safety. So we stopped prosecuting drug possession and paraphernalia and prostitution and minor traffic offenses and rogue and vagabond and urinating and defecating in public. We dismissed over 1400 cases that pertain to those offenses. We quashed or what, what was called eliminated 1415 warrants for those offenses. We pushed the governor to reduce the prison population, which resulted in two executive orders on the early release of over 2,000 individuals. We opened a sentencing review unit to review and reduce excessive sentences for juveniles in the elderly prison population. And we refined our approach to bail twice so that we were only focusing on individuals that pose an actual public safety risk. And in that year, I have to tell you, it was what we thought in theory was actual practicality. What we thought was nothing had nothing to do with public safety turned out to have so absolutely have nothing to do with public safety. And so the data that we analyzed after we implemented these policies in a, in, in a year out and further showed that individuals committing these low level offenses, these minor offenses that had nothing to do with public safety, that these weren't the trigger pullers, right? In the year in which we 
analyze this data, we saw that there was a 20% reduction in violent crime in the city of Baltimore. There was a 36% reduction and decrease in the individuals going in and out of the jail system. There was an 80% reduction in, in the decrease of drug arrests. And then almost 18 months out, and you'll hear from, from Susan Sherman yourself, but less than a 1% recidivism rate. And so what we thought in theory was practicality. Those, those minor offenses that we believed in theory had nothing to do with public safety actually had nothing to do with public safety. Coming out of a global pandemic where we have over 300 homicides in a city like ours in Baltimore City, we said we need to be smart, right? We don't want to be counterproductive to the limited law enforcement resources that we have as a community. And we need to be focusing our time, our attention on violent offenses coming out of a global pandemic where we're always, always and already backlogged. And then the third sort of, I guess, uh, issue that we considered and factor that we considered in making our policies permanent was that we saw all across the country, guys, right? And in, in, in the height of the global pandemic, what it meant for these low level offenses that are being discriminately enforced against black and brown people in this country. You look at Freddie Gray, who merely made eye contact with police in a high crime neighborhood and decided to run, he ended up dead. You look at, at George Floyd, who was alleged to have passed a counterfeit bill during a global pandemic for groceries, he, he ended up dead. You look at Sandra Bland, who failed to put on a turn signal, and she ended up dead. You look at Dante Wright, who either had expired tags or air fresheners in his rear view mirror. During a global pandemic, he ended up dead. And so when you look at these minor offenses for Black people in this country, these minor offenses can lead to a death sentence. And considering all three of those factors, right, that has nothing to do with public safety, it's counterproductive to the limited resources that we have when we're focusing on violent crime, and that these laws, these low-level offenses are being discriminately enforced on Black and brown people, we stop prosecuting these offenses permanently in the city of Baltimore. Thank you. It's always, it's always an honor to follow State's Attorney Mosby, and uh, we really appreciate the opportunity that we've had working with her and her really wickedly smart staff in her office in providing the evidence to uplift drug, sex work, and other decriminalization. Um, thanks to Sheila, who is not on camera, but just uh, puts together an amazing panel very efficiently. Uh, and thus, yeah, for moderating this panel and the other panelists, I really appreciate that DPA is doing this at this time. I also last uh, acknowledgement are Dr. Saba Rouhani and um, Dr. Catherine Tomko, my co-authors. Saba would be presenting with me except for an eight-week-old young boy named Nima, who she had eight weeks ago. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, next slide please, our preliminary evaluation answering these three questions, um, specifically today focusing on drug and prostitution charges, the impact of uh, decriminalization of those two charges in Baltimore. Uh, in Baltimore. A few months after uh, State's Attorney Mosby implemented this policy shift, folks from our office um, got in touch with us to see if we'd be interested in evaluating the policy. And, after we met with them, we came up with these three questions. So our original intent was before it was announced that uh, after 14 months that these policies would stay in effect, we first wanted to answer for the first year, were individuals whose drug and prostitution charges dropped due to this shift subsequently arrested for more serious crimes? So that speaks to recidivism. Was the policy shift associated with reductions in arrests for drug possessions, uh, I'll show that today, overall and by race, ethnicity, um, and how many of those arrests were averted. And how, so that's like, was it actually implemented by the police as it was meant to be? And then how did the policy shift impact pub public concerns as measured by 911 calls? Next slide, please. So not to get too deep in the weeds, but just to say, um, what I'm giving, presenting today is looking at comparisons between the 26 months before the policy's implementation compared to the ensuing 14-month period. 
Um, we use two sources of arrest data, all of which were de-identified. The first is what the state's attorney uses. It's uh, Maryland the Maryland Judicial JIS, uh, Judicial Information System, which reflects arrests that result in a court case and are therefore more likely to end in prosecution, conviction, and or sentencing. So those are not just all of the arrests in Baltimore City. That is in the Baltimore City Police Department database, which interestingly enough, we used because the JIS does not have information on race ethnicity. Um, we looked at not just prostitution and drug crimes, but in trying to understand if there were actual, if the trends that we saw in those uh, changes in crimes, the crimes of interest were real, or it was our effect of COVID, police arrest patterns. We also looked in a number, at a number of other crimes to see the trends during this pre and post period. And then, as I mentioned, um, we obtained through publicly available the 911 call um, data set, which is huge because there are tens of thousands of calls, hundreds of thousands of calls each month. And we analyzed all with any drug mentions as I'm gonna to present today. Okay, so the first, um, you know, the first criticism always of something like this kind of policy is, you know, if people aren't arrested for drugs, they're gonna go on to commit more serious crimes. So we examined if individuals who benefited from the policy through having their warrants crossed, cro I never can say that word, quashed, or charges dropped um, against them, did they go on to commit more serious offenses, robbery, assault, murder, weapons, kidnapping, drug distribution in that post-policy period? Next slide, please. And what we found was pretty amazing. Of the 741 individuals who we could match a, a unique identifier, anonymous unique identifier in the JIS database, only six went on to be rearrested for public safety crimes, the crimes that I just mentioned in this post-policy period. That is 0.8%, which is, you know, a very low percent. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the next question was, how was this policy implemented? Were there actually changes in arrest around drug possession or drug paraphernalia? Although all, we categorize arrest by their top charge and drug paraphernalia is rarely a top charge. So that's why you'll see slides just for drug possession stats. Okay, so basically to look and see were there, what were the trends in arrests for drug possession over time and um, were arrests averted, we did something called an interrupted time series. We basically looked at each month before in the pre-period and compared those monthly changes to those in the post period. We also calculated averted arrests. So that meaning if the policy shift hadn't happened, things kind of continued as usual, how many arrests would we have predicted to happen? And then we subtracted the observed, the actual number of arrests and came up with this, how many arrests were averted. Next slide, please. This figure shows the total and monthly number averages of arrests, which you can see was significantly increasing before the shift. That's that first yellow line on the left. Immediately after the policy was changed, there was a very big significant drop in the arrests that continued to decrease, although at a slower pace during the post-policy period. So an average of 96 arrests for drug possession were happening in Baltimore City in the 26 months preceding this policy shift. And that changed to an average of six arrests a month, which were decreasing during this post-policy period. We estimated that there would have been 548 arrests if nothing had changed. And so an overall 482 arrests were averted. I know I have time, my time is limited, but that number is astounding. 482 people would have been arrested, families would have, would have been without a family member, cops would have been writing up complaints, et cetera, that weren't happening after the policy went into place. Okay, next slide, please. This is the only data that we use that um, publicly available Baltimore police data set. Interestingly enough, um, we had the hardest time figuring out, we were trying to look at 
Blacks, whites, Hispanics, and other. And it turned out there was no Hispanic race category because it was all categorized as Asian. So we just looked at the impact of this change on Blacks compared to other, which was predominantly white and then Asian. Um, and basically what you can see is that using that same um, formula of calculating what would have happened if there had been known change, there were 443 arrests averted during the policy shift looking at Baltimore police data 78% of them, 345, were among African-Americans. So interestingly enough, even though I'm not showing that data, that shows that African-Americans had the biggest impact, this policy, of course, because they were the highest number of um, people that were arrested were African-American. Um, they still are being arrested at a higher rate compared to other categories, although the numbers have shifted. But uh, we're at a much better starting point than we were previously. Next slide, please. So the last data that I'm going to show, show you are 911 calls. Next slide, please. And you know, this is an, another common argument against drug and sex work decrim is that criminal activity will continue and impact the lives of quote unquote, everyday citizens, people in the neighborhood discounting that people who are arrested for drugs and sex work actually live in the neighborhood and are citizens as well. So we found no evidence that this everyday citizen argument actually held true. Um, you can see that while 911 calls were decreasing in advance of the policy shift for other reasons, um, there were significantly greater reductions um, in mean monthly complaints about of any drug mentioned in the post policy period. And actually in total, there were 33%, there was a 33% reduction in 911 calls with drug mentions. Next slide, please. So I sometimes call some of the work that we do kind of offensive research um, or defensive research in this case, because uh, this policy has been, has shifted. And, but these are things that we need to show kind of the concerns that people most often have that, you know, no, people are not going to go on to be, weren't, didn't go on to be rearrested. Um, actually, very few were rearrested. Um, the fact that there was an incredible decrease, a third decrease in the calls of public, to, public complaints around drug around drugs. And we actually did comparisons. Um, I failed to mention, and I'm not, don't have time to show the data, but we looked at serious crimes, the trends in 911 calls and arrests, and we didn't see the same significant changes at all relative to those related to drugs. Last slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, so just in summary from this very preliminary time period, Declining to prosecute low-level drug and prostitution offenses um, avert arrest, may avert arrests among individuals with intersecting vulnerabilities without posing a threat to public safety or resulting in public complaints. I think so much of the time, a lot of community and neighborhood association meetings I've gone to, even though cops are in the room saying, look, having more cops here will not make, make a huge difference. We can't arrest our way out of the problem. People still really focus on, we need, to, we need to come down harder. We need to arrest more people. As opposed to, next slide please, really shifting, putting pressure on cities and jurisdictions to have um, more funds go to health and social services. Because we know that people who are not being arrested have great who had formerly been arrested have great needs and that's what i think we should really put pressure on uh, public officials to expand social services especially in a place like baltimore there of course um, we and dr rohani is leading more extensive analyses over time there are a lot more questions but um that's all that i have to say today and i want to acknowledge that last slide please uh, the state's attorney's office who was really great to work with um, the state's attorney uh, herself for allowing us to do uh, this evaluation. Michael Collins, who used to work at DPA, was really kind of our connect with her office. And um, of course, we want to thank uh, those who were arrested and who were really casualties of the war on drugs whose data I presented today. Thanks.
Well, hi, thank everybody. You so um, thank you. Um, and thank you to Drug Policy Alliance and Fair and Just Prosecution and Johns Hopkins for having me here today. Um, we can go ahead and put my slides up. So I'm going to talk about work that um, I've been doing with Jennifer Doliak at Texas A&M and Amanda Agin on misdemeanor prosecution. And the work I'm going to talk about today includes um, prosecution for uh, possession of small quantities of prohibited substances. So drug prosecution is, is one of the categories of nonviolent misdemeanors that we're going to be talking about. We're also interested, like Susan, we're also interested in the public safety consequences of prosecutors' decisions about whether or not to prosecute these cases. And, and the work that I'm going to talk about, we're trying to really take seriously the skeptics of, of non-prosecution um, who, who, might, who might really be concerned about the potential of public safety aspects. Next slide, please. And just remember that the work that Susan just talked about, you know, the in, in Baltimore, the non-prosecution policy decision came in, in March 2020, March, April 2020, precisely because of the pandemic. So the pre-period is January 18 through March 2020. The post-period is April 2020 through May 2021. But that means we're comparing pre-pandemic and pandemic periods, right? And one thing we know from arrest rates more generally is that they fell off a cliff in, in March of 2020. And so we have to be, it's like, it's really challenging to compare pre-2020 and pre-March and post-March 2020. So we were, we tried to think about, well, how can we, you know, address the, the skeptics concern that, that really, you know, we're, we're not actually showing a causal effect of non-prosecution on outcomes. And really, you know, what we're trying to do here is to think about there's this potential deterrent effect that, that Susan and, and State's Attorney Mosby talked about, that if we prosecute these minor crimes, individuals will be less likely to commit additional crimes in the future. But we're also really worried about these collateral consequences of prosecution. In particular, we're very concerned about the effects on individuals of having criminal records, not just of convictions, but even just of charges. And in our context, which is going to be Suffolk County, Massachusetts, the criminal record acquisition kicks in when a case is taken to arraignment, when a defendant stands up in front of a judge and enters a plea. If an assistant district attorney closes the case before that step, the individual in the case will not receive a criminal record of charges. So what we're really looking at is the decision to move forward with prosecution, which will result in a criminal record of charges, independently of whatever happens with conviction and not prosecuting that case. Next slide, please. So we have these, um, we uh, cooperated with Suffolk County, um, which <laughs> formerly uh, was uh, uh, District Attorney Rachel Rollins. And we have data from 2004 to 2020, which includes every complaint that was brought to the DA's office, um, those that were prosecuted, those that were not prosecuted. And we have information on all the stages of, of the case, as well as the individual identifying information about, um, about the individual arrested person. Next slide, please. And just to note about the racial disparities that are happening here, about 26% of Suffolk County residents are black, but about 47% of the misdemeanor, the nonviolent misdemeanor defendants in our sample are black. So there's, so black defendants are disproportionately overrepresented in the sample of, of prosecuted, I'm sorry, of just, of just criminal complaints involving nonviolent misdemeanors. Next slide, please. So what we're looking at is this very, as I said, this very first stage in a case, which is um, whether a case, a complaint, an arrest proceeds to arraignment or whether it's closed um, um, at or, or prior to the arraignment happening um, without a conviction. And so we're looking at, that's what we're calling prosecution, is whether it moves forward to arraignment or not. And in, in this sample of nonviolent misdemeanor defendants, we have about 21% of these cases are not prosecuted between 2004 and 2018. So we're looking at the period before District Attorney um, Rachel Rollins takes office. Next slide, please. Now you could just compare outcomes, right? For defendants that are prosecuted and not prosecuted. But next slide, please. You don't wanna do that because there's a choice being made by assistant district attorneys in these cases. They're choosing 
to prosecute these cases or not. And you look at the, the case and defendant characteristics for the cases that are prosecuted versus those that are not prosecuted, and you're going to see some really clear differences. Um, so, you know, you can, you can look at our paper. I think somebody's putting a link in the chat if you want to look at these more closely, but essentially these are, these are not comparable bundles of cases. Next slide, please. So, you know, if, if you, if you were, if you had a magic wand um, or, you know, you could, you had a sandbox you could play in um, to simulate this, you might want to randomize this choice, right? To flip a coin every time an individual comes in into a courtroom and, and to see whether they're prosecuted or not. And then you could follow outcomes. Well, we don't have that kind of a sandbox. We don't have a magic wand and we're certainly not, it's not, wouldn't be ethical for us to do this. Next slide, please. So what we do is we take advantage of the fact that in a big urban jurisdiction like Suffolk County or like many of, of the jurisdictions um, around the country, there are lots of assistant district attorneys who oversee arraignments. They rotate across courtrooms. In this sample of cases between 2004 and 2018, we have 315 ADAs who are supervising arraignments. Um, and once we take into account the court in the day of the week and the month, we get this, this, essentially this as if random rotation of ADAs who are being assigned to cases. Um, so as a defendant, next slide please, it's really the, the luck of the draw, whether you get a more lenient defendant who is more likely to not prosecute or a more a stricter, defend, a stricter ADA. So here's just a graph of what ADA, we call it leniency, looks like over time um, on average. And this, these are the rates at which ADAs prosecute these cases or not. So some ADAs don't prosecute a lot of these nonviolent misdemeanor cases, and, and some of these ADAs prosecute almost all of them. So we're leveraging that variation across ADAs. Next slide, please. So if we look at the, the defendants, the cases that happen to get a low leniency ADA, happen to get you know, one of the stricter ADAs, versus the defendants who happen to get a high leniency ADA. Now, if we look at the case and defendant characteristics, they look really comparable across those two sets of cases. So that helps us, that gives us some confidence in the assumption that, you know, it really is the luck of the draw, whether you get, you know, Miriam who's really strict or, <laughs> or you get Anna who's really lenient. Next slide, please. So we're using this as like a, a natural experiment. Um, uh, so you're lucky enough to get a leaning ADA or you're not lucky um, enough to get a leaning ADA. And so for some of the defendants in our sample, this is impacting whether or not you're prosecuted. And we call these the marginal defendants in our sample. Next slide, please. So, these, so this is just the top line findings um, for these marginal defendants for whom, again, it's like a flip of the coin, whether you got a more lenient um, or a less lenient ADA. Defendants who are not prosecuted have a 58% reduction in the probability of a new criminal complaint within two years. Um, there's a reduction in the number of new complaints. In Suffolk County, these are like arrests a reduction in the number of almost 70%. Um, and, and this extends not just to, to cases that are like the original case, which is a nonviolent misdemeanor case. We see these reductions also in felony um, uh, arrests. So we're seeing reductions in new misdemeanor complaints of 67%, but reductions in new felony complaints of 75%. Next slide, please. And here's just a picture of what it looks like over time. You see that where the x-axis is months since the criminal complaint. And so you can see, and this is the effect, this is effect on the probability of getting a new criminal complaint as a function of having not been prosecuted. And the horizontal line at the top is zero. So you can see immediately the effect of non-prosecution is to reduce the probability of getting a new criminal complaint. And importantly, that effect is growing over time. So this is over a three-year window. Um, and we can actually, we can, <laughs> we've been experimenting, we can show you six years and it just keeps going down. So this is, this is um, non-prosecution appears to be very protective of public safety and communities over time. Next slide, please. So why is this happening? Um, well, we think there's three potential things that are going on that are kind of all bundled together in non-prosecution. We can't disentangle. Um, so I'll just flag these for you. The first is that we do think that, that not having a criminal record, um, which is, as we know from other work, is a real barrier to, um, to, to legal employment. Um, and, and so 
the defendants in our sample, if they're not prosecuted, you see a reduction in the probability that they are in the statewide criminal record system of 56%. Also reduces the amount of time that they have an open case. So you might think that these nonviolent misdemeanor cases are closed really quickly, um, even if they're prosecuted. They stay open for an average of six months. So that's six months of having to come back to hearings and meetings that you might, you know, you might not make. So those might be additional problems for you, or that might be disruptive of your work or your family life. And then finally, um, by construction. If you're not prosecuted, you're you're also you're not going to be convicted. But if you are prosecuted, there's a chance um, that you're going to wind up with an even worse kind of criminal record. And about 26% of the prosecuted defendants in our sample do get a conviction in their case. Next slide, please. Um, so we also looked at so that's that work tells us something about discretion, right? The discretion that individual ADAs have and and the effects of that discretion. We might also be interested in something like um, the, the, the Baltimore policy change, right? So there was also a policy change when District Attorney Rollins came into office in January 2019. So we did something similar to what, to what Susan's team is doing in Baltimore, and we're looking at the effect of that policy change, um, which was a reduction in prosecution of nonviolent misdemeanor cases. And we do see, we see effects on, on rearrest of very similar magnitudes to those that we see using the discretionary kind of um, research design. Next slide, please. We also look at, at, at crime more generally. So one thing that people worry about is not just the specific deterrence for the individual defendants in these cases, but also crime more generally. If we announce that we're not going to prosecute a set of crimes, is that, does that just you know, open the floodgates to lawlessness? So here are just um, reported crime rates um, using Boston PD crime data, and, um, and, we, and we just see no, no effects on crime rates as a function of that policy change. Next slide, please. We have a second paper where we've um, collected data on 35 jurisdictions that have elected quote unquote reform prosecutors um, between 2015 and 2021. Um, again, pulling uh, pulling uh, reported crime data from those jurisdictions, and we um, in that larger sample, we again see no effects on local crime rates. Next slide, please. So, just in summary, um, so it looks like uh, you know to, to to support Susan's findings um, that reducing prosecutions of these marginal, nonviolent misdemeanor defendants um, really is protective of public safety. It reduces future criminal legal system contact, and a policy of of reducing prosecutions is going to disproportionately um, benefit Black defendants, thereby reducing racial disparities in the criminal justice system. Simply because Black defendants are disproportionately represented in in this sample of cases. Um, and I just want to flag that bullet point. And in our work, I think we're also seeing that diversion. It's really important that if we're talking about diversion or alternatives to prosecution, that those alternatives kick in before the acquisition of a criminal record, because we think that's one of the primary mechanisms driving these protective findings. Um, next slide, please. And that's it. I'm all done. And I look forward to any questions that you have. Well, I think I'm up next and um, want to thank as well the wonderful partners at DPA, in particular Sheila and others for setting the stage for what is a very important, very timely conversation. Um, it's always great to be in the company of such great thinkers and leaders, um, such as Marilyn and Anna and Susan. Um, although I, I am in the unenviable position of having to come after all of your brilliance, but I'll do my best um, to add some perspectives. And I think what I want to do is add perspectives, both in terms of my own personal experience, having seen up close the failures that Marilyn so eloquently talked about of the war on drugs in the decades of the 80s and the 90s, as well as some perspectives around what does the national picture look like? among prosecutors all over the country who are seeking to propel change? What are some of the crises of the moment that they and others are addressing as we try to shift these paradigms? And what can we learn from how that video so well captured at the outset on that trip that a number of elected leaders, Marilyn and others joined us on, namely, how can we expand our horizons and really not presume that we know best 
from what's happening inside our borders, but benefit from the work, the perspective, the changes that have been made in other countries. So starting with that first more individual perspective, um, I spent 15 years as a federal prosecutor and a number of those years were working specifically on narcotics and organized crime cases. What I saw firsthand were those deep failures that have been recounted of the policies and the practices of the so-called war on drugs. I saw more and more young people of color entering our criminal legal system, unforgiving and increasingly harsh consequences when they came through that front door that allowed no ability to really consider the characteristics or the humanity of the individual. Um, I saw inflexible sentencing laws, charging laws, practices, and sadly, what that work was doing was destroying lives and destroying communities with really no benefit in terms of making our communities safer or healthier. And the great research and work that Susan and Anna have done have confirmed that conclusion. Namely, these practices are not inuring to the benefit of promoting safer and healthier communities. So today we see a growing recognition among leaders around the country and within our communities that a public health approach is what is needed to address a public health problem that we simply can't criminalize and punish and incarcerate our way out of these kinds of struggles that individuals are, are, are dealing with in our communities. And that a criminal legal system that has limited resources inherently has better things to do than to try to criminalize and punish this type of conduct. And we are seeing more and more leaders as well owning and acknowledging the deeply troubling racial disparities that are inherent in what we've been doing over these decades. So at Fair and Just Prosecution, we feel very privileged to be working with this new generation of leaders. We were formed around five years ago, and at the time we set a table that 14 elected leaders gathered around. Today we have elected leaders that in total represent nearly 20% of our nation's population. So this moment, has become a movement. And it's a movement that I think is fueled by a recognition in communities that we have to change what we're doing. We can't keep banging our head against a wall and presuming that we're gonna get anything other than a deeply bruised forehead. Um, we need to stop destroying lives the way we've been doing for decades. So as we aim to pivot and shift some of those paradigms, what are some of the challenges and crises that are being dealt with? Well, I think first of all, we have to recognize that we have an incarceration crisis. On any given day, there are 450,000 people incarcerated and behind bars in our country. And one in every five of them is in there for a drug offense. This is not just a human cost, this is also a fiscal cost. Since 1971, our country has spent, and the war on drugs has cost, that cost an estimated $1 trillion. That should be appalling as we think about the waste, waste of lives, waste of money. We also secondly know that we have a fiscal crisis um, as well as an overdose crisis that we're dealing with. From April 2020 to April 2021, over 100,000 people died from drug overdose. And we know that that is a record number. It is a dramatic increase from an equally disturbing figure a year earlier of 72,000 overdose deaths. And finally, we know that we have a racial disparity crisis. While the overdose crisis has hit all demographics, no group has seen a bigger hit or a bigger um, memorialization of those, those tragic overdose deaths than Black men just as we know that Black people are four times more likely to be arrested for cannabis possession than white people. And if you want to see great evidence of how that intersects with drug policy, look at the Baltimore policy that was so eloquently put together around why we need to change cannabis criminalization in our country. So where do we go from here? We know that prosecutors hold the key to bringing about change. And as was pointed out so well by Tisha at the beginning, prosecutors have this critical role 
at the front door of the justice system. They are the gatekeepers of what comes into our criminal legal system. If they hold up a stop sign, it does not come through that front door. And I think that we need as well to recognize when we focus a little bit on some of the data that we've heard, that we need policies in offices where the fortuity of the prosecutor that you draw, whether it's a lenient prosecutor or an overly harsh prosecutor, is not going to design define the fate of your case and your future. We need office policies that are looking to create some stability, some predictability, and better thinking around this, these issues. And luckily now, we have a new generation of leaders that are increasingly adopting a harm reduction focused approach. They're using their discretion to stop and put a stop sign up at that front door, to not prosecute and not criminalize individuals who are struggling with a public health issue. And increasingly they're recognizing that if the criminal legal system gets out of the way, we are more likely to see public health and other support systems fill the void. But as long as the criminal legal system is filling that space, those systems will not flock in and fill that space. So where are we seeing that around the country? In addition to Baltimore, in addition to Boston, we're seeing things like Dan Satterberg in Seattle, who has said that he will no longer prosecute possession of smaller quantities of any drug, not just cannabis, but any drug. We're seeing in Nueces County in Texas, so this is a red state, blue state, rural, urban phenomenon alike. We're seeing Mark Gonzalez in Nueces County say that he will not prosecute small quantities of cannabis. We're seeing Deborah Gonzalez in Georgia stopping the prosecution of cannabis as well as drug paraphernalia cases. We're seeing Sarah George in Vermont, who is modeling so many important things around harm reduction, including the recognition that we shouldn't prosecute buprenorphine possession. We're seeing Ellie Savitt in Washtenaw County in Michigan, halting the prosecution of cannabis, of buprenorphine, of methadone. We're seeing Mike Schmidt in Oregon championing things like the Oregon reforms that were referenced at the outset and decriminalizing through his advocacy as well as his implementation of those reforms, possession of all, of all drugs in small quantities. And we're also casting a view outside of our borders, as I mentioned earlier. If you look at what has gone on in a country like Portugal, we know that two decades ago, they were facing the same type of overdose crisis that our country faced. And we know that they took steps to end the practices that have been the starting point, the anchor for where we are in the US. And where have they come in the 20 years since? In addition to destigmatizing, in addition to decriminalizing, they have dramatically reduced by 80% their overdose deaths. They're saving lives. They have the lowest rate of drug-induced deaths in the Western Europe um, area. So I would suggest that at a time when we are losing too many lives in our country already, at a time when we know we have choices, at a time when we know that data tells us that communities are no less safe if we move away from these practices, at a time when we know that public health can and will step up if the criminal legal system steps out of that space, I would suggest that it's a time to work together and think about a different paradigm and a different starting point. And I would end with the words of that individual that we saw and met with in Portugal, who said, we are not criminals, we are human, we are people. Let's stop destigmatizing those people and let's try to do better as we think about these issues. So thanks again to DPA for bringing us together for this conversation. Thank you so much, Miriam. Um, and I think we're going to have all our panelists back on screen because it's now time for questions. So thank you all for your, all of your insights um, and the amazing work you're doing to try and really ground health and public health in drug policy and maybe promoting more saner drug policy. Uh, so thanks again. Um, so I know there are questions from the audience that are 
queuing up, uh, but I'll kick it off uh, with, the, with a question for our panelists and then uh, to the audience, please continue to send in your questions. We hope to answer as many of them as possible. Um, so Marilyn, maybe I'll start off with you. Um, you touched upon this, uh, you know, and, and gave us kind of an overview, but could you maybe tell us what were some of the factors that influenced your decisions not to prosecute low-level offenses such as drug possession? And then a related question, what has been the reaction of the police commissioner and the mayor? So I think it's a great question. I think I, I touched upon what the factors were that we considered in making those policies permanent. One, that we considered in theory that they had no public safety value. We were able to confirm that with the brilliance of Johns Hopkins University, right? And, and, and you know, Dr. Sherman, who confirmed that for us, those weren't the individuals, the target population weren't the individuals that were the trigger pullers. Um, and then when you look at you're coming out of a global pandemic, right, where you have a backlog of cases right now, we are literally even right now as we speak, the courts are closed. And so they've been closed intermittently for the past three years. And so the court has to prioritize and the court has prioritized those cases that involve violent individuals. And when you look at a city like Baltimore, where we have 300 homicides, homicides a, year, a year, we should, we be, should be prioritizing, prioritizing violent, violent individuals. individuals. And clogging up the system for these minor offenses that have nothing to do with public safety based off the data, like makes absolutely no sense. And so you have the first, no public safety data. I mean, no, no, no public safety value. You have the second factor, which is we're coming out of a global pandemic and we need to prioritize. And it's pretty counterproductive to utilize our limited law enforcement resources on, on crimes that have nothing to do with public safety. And then what was most compelling to me was the fact that these, these laws, whether we're talking about marijuana possession, where nationwide, if you're a black person, we know there's no disparate use among white and black people when it comes to marijuana usage, but there's a disparate sort of enforcement, right? When it comes to the actual possession and the arrest of black people in this country. If you're a black person, you're four times more likely in this country to be arrested for mere possession of marijuana. In the city of Baltimore, you were six times more likely to be arrested for mere possession of marijuana. When you look at the data, we the reason why I looked at it and, and we decriminalized 10 grams or less of marijuana, 42% where, where we were, the, the, the police were responsible for issuing citations for 10 grams or less of marijuana. 42% of the citations that they were issuing went in one out of nine police districts. That one police district was 95% black and disproportionately impoverished. And so if you're focusing only on these individuals that are in the Western district, which I happen to live in, and you're not focusing on the individuals that live in the inner harbor or all these other sort of areas within the city, of course, you're gonna have a disparate sort of enforcement. And so what I understood and what Miriam so eloquently stated is that as prosecutors, we decide who's gonna be charged, what they're gonna be charged with, what sentence recommendations we're gonna make. We decide if somebody's gonna get into the criminal justice system in the first place. And utilizing my power and discretion, one of the things that I was very candid about was that I will never be complicit in the discriminatory enforcement of laws against poor black and brown people. And so using that discretion, I, I said, we're, those are the three factors that we're no longer going to apply. We're no longer going to prosecute not only marijuana, but we're not only going to, we're not going to prosecute sex work, which is disproportionately uh, in, in, in enforced against Black people. <laughs> we're no longer going to prosecute drugs, right? No matter if it's marijuana or whatever, whatever it may be, let's treat it as the public health crisis that it is. We now recognize when we talk about it in the suburbs that it's a public health crisis. But for decades, we've been criminalizing poor black and brown people. Like under my watch, let's let's ensure that we're doing the same thing. Let's let's be consistent in that. And I can tell you, having worked with five police commissioners and four mayors in six years, which that level of instability should never exist. But I can tell you that you know it was difficult. It's it, it's still very difficult. Right. Implementing a policy like this, especially when we're under a consent decree where there was a pattern and practice of discriminatory enforcement of the eighth largest police department in the country, where we had officers planting guns and drugs on citizens 
for decades, right? And so it's very, very difficult because there's a culture within the police department that has to change. And so when you come out and you basically say, we're not going to do this, that gives them the ability to say, well, we can't do our jobs. So we're still prosecuting drug dealers, but I can't tell you how many community association forums, meetings that I've had to attend, round tables, you know, town halls. We've gone to their, their meetings. We've done training sessions. We've gone to the roll calls where you have officers, patrol officers telling citizens directly, we can't do our job. Somebody was just shot in front of them. Well, we can't, we can't do anything because Marilyn Mosby won't prosecute marijuana. What? That doesn't make any sense, right? <laughs> that doesn't have any, like, they, we've had, literally had police officers that have responded to people's houses where they were caught on camera attempting to burglarize the home. And they'll come back, chase the person down and say, I'm sorry, ma'am, we can't arrest this person for trespassing because Marilyn Mosby won't 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 prosecute trespassing. And I'm like, that has nothing to do with an attempted burglary. (laughs) So it's been difficult. And we have our challenges. And, you know, we're working through them as a city. But what helps is exactly what was put out by Johns Hopkins and by the research uh, of Dr. Sherman, right? Like we we need that to to, to reaffirm. And, and, and it doesn't help that also I'm in election season. So it's really bad right now because they want to blame me for any and everything that takes place. But it, it is it presents its challenges. It gives, you know, those the, the, the command staff, the police commissioner is on board, but those that report to him are not necessarily on board. They want to conduct business as usual. And this is something that, you know, people are resistant to change. And this is change. And so it, it is, it presents its challenges, but we're working through it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for forging ahead despite the opposition of, you know, strong system actors. Um, and as you mentioned, the research is clear uh, in terms of some of the public safety and public health outcomes of, you know, declining to prosecute. And we know from decades of failed drug policy, uh, look at where we are. Uh, and, you know, I think all of you touched upon the mass incarceration crisis, as well as the, you know, opioid crisis that we're in, the overdose crisis we're in. So, um, yeah. So anyway, well, hopefully the research will be persuasive to members of the public rather than some of the, the rhetoric from some of the systems actors. Um, and then also, I think a conversation for another day is, you know, if we truly want to treat drug use as a health issue, the distinction between drug sellers and drug users is very fluid. Um, it's a very fluid membrane. Um, and, you know, depending on the day, someone might be a drug user and other days a drug seller. And so it's really important for prosecutor discretion to apply broadly in the context of, of drug policy and addressing issues of, of drugs in, in our communities. Uh, but thank you, Marilyn. And so now I, I think I'd like to go to the researchers. Um, and first, if you could maybe, so both Susan and Anna, if you could just tell us, maybe provide some advice uh, that you have for other researchers who may be interested in studying you know, outcomes of prosecutor offices. So if you could, maybe Susan, we'll start with you. And then Anna, if you could add anything after that. I wanted to start with Anna. She's done this in lots, lots more places. Um, you know, I think this is true of how do researchers work with fill in the blanks, know the people where you live. I be volunteer. I've been a volunteer researcher for the health department on and off for two decades. I mean, share your skill set. This also was something you know that we did because we thought it was important. Um, when Michael came and asked me if we'd be interested in evaluating this, just if you're out there, which sometimes can be for better or for worse, um, share your skills. So uh, go to community meetings. Um, I, I don't know who's on the call, but I'm sure there are a lot of people who do this kind of work. But if you are junior or new to this field, I just think it's important to kind of know the players um, and be a part of the community in which you're researching. Yeah, no, I I agree with that. And I would also say, um, because hopefully there are some elected district attorneys and their staffs listening on the call today, I would also say uh, 
you know, as a message to the district attorney community, you know, it's win-win. It is win-win to work with a research team as district attorney Mosby and, you know, as, as district attorney Rollins did in Suffolk County. You know, I think some of you, this, this story has been told in some outlets, but before I was introduced to Rachel Rollins, um, I, I had been, you know, <laughs> burning the shoe leather, um, talking to district attorneys, suggesting a study like this, um, and was just getting turned away um, from one after the other of the offices. And the concern was always, well, you know, what happens if the findings come back and suggest that, in fact, declining, you know, increases for arrest, um, you know, that we don't want that. <laughs> and, you know, and I would say, well, geez, wouldn't you want to know that? You know, wouldn't you want, if that was really the case, we don't think that's not our intuition, right? It's not our hunch. But if that were the case, wouldn't you want to know that? And then then you could adapt and you could learn. Um, but it wasn't something that we could get offices um, to, to agree. And then I was introduced to Rachel Rollins, which, who, you know, for those of you who have met her, I mean, she's just a force of nature. And, I, you know, within two weeks of, of Rachel's inauguration, I had been invited up to Suffolk County um, and, and was sitting having lunch with her. And Rachel said, look, I, I just have one request of you, and that's to tell me the truth. Like, you go do your work, you come back. And she's like, I don't want you to sugarcoat it. She's like, that's the thing I'm most worried about, is that you're just going to tell me what I want to hear. That's not what I want to hear. And, you know, we walked out of, of the office that day. She signed a data use agreement. We walked out with, you know, with, with the data. So that's, and, and it was win-win. <laughs> but I think, you know, even Rachel would say, and I would say, if the findings had come back that showed that declination was in fact not protective of public safety, you know, she would have adapted. She would have, she would, right? Because that's an important concern. And so I think, you know, it would be great if more offices would cooperate with researchers. Um, and, 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 and I, I again, the message that I want to, I, I want to suggest is you don't have anything to lose um, because, because we all learn um, and, and, we, and we can adapt going forward. Great, thank you so much, Anna. Um, and Mary, so Mary, I'd like to maybe turn to you. Um, there have been a number of public health and, and harm reduction advances in communities across the country, um, including our recent victory in New York City to open oh. up overdose prevention sites. Carolyn, yep. Oh. Hi, can okay. you hear me okay? Uh, I can hear you, I'm on a call. Uh, What's up? Um, my name is Tracy, I'm calling with uh, Marilyn, we actually can, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, so I'm sorry, Maria, maybe I'll, I can try the question again. Uh, so there's been a number of public health and harm reduction advances in communities across the country, including a recent our recent victory in New York City to open overdose prevention sites, and as well as just to move away from drug courts. Why are these important and how does it recognize the nature of, of recovery? Yeah, so thank you for that. And, um, you know, I think that both of those efforts are really in many ways predicated on two starting points. First and foremost, we should try to save lives. If we can't save lives, we can't help people. Um, and so we know that if you look across the globe, there are 110 overdose pre prevention sites, or sometimes called safe consumption sites, in 11 countries around the globe. Um, the U.S. has been slow to open those sorts of doors to recognize that fundamental starting point that we just have to be able to find a way to save lives. It makes no sense to be requiring people to use in the shadows, to use in, in places where when and if they overdose, there will be nobody there to help them. And so we are thrilled to see New York opening its doors to facilities. We know that as of, I think, just a couple of days ago, 640 people had been through those sites in New York City. I believe that recent statistics showed that 125 drug overdoses were averted. That has to matter. And we are heartened by the fact that the federal government and the Department of Justice does not seem to be reverting to the prior position that shut down efforts in Philadelphia to open safe house, which would have been 
the nation's first fully public um, overdose prevention facility. But instead, it sounds like the Department of Justice is looking to try to think through what are the guardrails and how do we make this more of a model throughout the country, not just in New York City. I think the second principle that is modeled more by recent thinking around drug courts and Fair and Just Prosecution put out an issue brief on the topic that tries to capture some of those sentiments is that in addition to saving lives, we need a criminal legal system that does no harm. If we don't start with the premise of we should do no harm, hopefully we're doing more than that, but at a minimum, we should not be doing harm. And that's got to be another critical anchor of where we start. And so while drug courts have been a positive advancement over the years, they are better than where we used to be, where we used to punish people when they would come through the doorway of the criminal legal system, and we would look to try to incarcerate our way out of the struggles they were dealing with. Drug courts tried to take it in a different direction, which was try to look to put people towards more of a pathway of a treatment modality. I think we also have to realize that there's still times when drug courts are not best, when they do harm, when they fail to recognize the natural progression of recovery, which is people will relapse. There is no linear pathway. People are along the way not going to be able to be coerced or punished out of natural human behavior, which often will involve zigs and zags and relapses. So we should take a long, hard look at some of the due process concerns with drug courts, at the fact that judges and lawyers are not trained clinicians. They are not the best people to be in charge of a treatment program or a treatment pro progression for individuals. That in many instances, drug courts, because of how they tend to be funded and studied, will often fail to serve those who are most in need. I think for all of those reasons, and if we accept the notion that we can't coerce people into treatment, that that is not aligned with a public health issue and the natural progression of, of relapse and of recovery, we have to ask what's best. And I think best is completely diverting those people from the justice system the way other countries have done and look for modalities where we give people help where we use the resources that we pour into drug courts instead for treatment and prevention options. And we try to do no harm by bringing people through the front door of our criminal justice system. Great, thank you so much, Miriam. Um, so I'm gonna weave in some questions from the audience and I'll, you know, I'll ask the question and someone can jump in and if not, maybe I could suggest um, somebody respond from the panel. Uh, so one question is, the criminal legal system has too much of an incentive to focus on punitive rather than rehabilitative measures for those competing, completing their sentence. And for example, prison labor, privately funded prisons, et cetera. What are some actionable steps we can take to incentivize rehabilitation first? And how do we make this a more humanizing situation? Anyone wanting to take that one on? Miriam, I know you just went, but um, Miriam and Marilyn, are there any suggestions or any responses you have to that? So I'll jump in with, with a few thoughts, um, and I'm sure Marilyn has some thoughts as well. Um, I think, first of all, we have successful pathways to re-entry for individuals and rehabilitation if we think long and hard at the outset whether they should be coming through the front door and entering you know a punitive system and and we need to do more not to simply divert but deflect but for those who do come in i do think that we need obviously more treatment options while people are behind bars you know um, map programs other types of things that at least recognize that when people have been isolated and removed from their supports and treatment, they're going to start to, um, to deteriorate. And we need ways to be able to ensure that those that we do put behind bars, that we take care of them, that public health is first and foremost, 
you know, one of the things that we're thinking about. And then when individuals do return to the community, we have to be smarter about the barriers that we put in their way. If we have lengthy periods of community supervision, of parole and probation, if we have conditions like, you know, at any time you um, are found in testing to have used drugs, we throw you right back behind jail and behind, and behind bars, then we are not setting people up for success. If we have uh, barriers to employment, again, we are increasing the stresses and not setting people up for success and producing trauma and other bur burdens that are going to lead people back to paths that are um, going to align themselves with a relapse trajectory rather than a successful trajectory. So the one thing I will say is that it's a really tricky issue. And the reason why I say that is because we have to be conscious of the fact that we, from a societal perspective, um, you know, we often resort to a default. And our default is the punitive approach in the American criminal justice system, right? We don't look at it from a rehabilitation perspective or to understand and recognize that if an individual is attempting to acclimate back into society and he's unable to get a job, unable to get housing, unable to get financial aid, what other recourse do they have but to go out doing what they were doing in the first place? We haven't thought that way. And, and so it's, it's going to require a societal shift and a cultural shift. And I, I talked about earlier, like the police department and that cultural shift is even more difficult than anything else. And that's what's gonna be required in, in American society when it comes to criminal justice system. I mean, just right now, right? Like you have progressive prosecutors, there's a handful of us that are willing to use our, our power, our discretion to do what's in the best interest to move, you know, and ensure racial equity and ending mass incarceration. But we have a, a, a larger short sort of backlash that is coming against us and saying violent crime, is what it is because of these progressive prosecutors. And we got to resort back to what we were doing in the first place, whether it's broken windows theory or lock them up approach, right? Like it, it was, we have to be very careful and cognizant. So when you ask that question, it's a very tricky sort of answer because I don't think culturally we're there. A lot of folks still don't recognize the importance of rehabilitation and, and rehabilitating individuals that are have to acclimate back into our society as opposed to punishing them. And that has been the approach of the American justice system, which is very different from other countries. You have compassion, you have respect, you have human dignity that we just do not appreciate in this country. And so I don't know if that's 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 possible yet. I think if you continue to have prosecutors and folks that are going to use their discretion and their and, and their and their autonomy to do what's right, then we can have that discussion. But I don't think we're there yet. Thank you, Marilyn and Miriam. Um, and so, kind of a, a maybe a question for anyone again uh, from the audience is: How do we advocate for these policies in our own communities? Um, we, we, you know, we see when a new administration comes in, oftentimes the policy changes. How can we ensure longevity? So I'm just adding my take on it. How can we add some longevity to these innovative policies that have been adopted? And so well, I, I have my, I have my, my, my perspective is, is like, we need, first of all, we need to pay attention locally to our elected officials, right? And the importance of our local prosecutors. And then we need, you know, researchers like Anna, like Dr. Sherman, like where, where we have data to support what we're doing. But we also need to ensure that we're supporting those that put their neck out on the line, right? And are getting their teeth kicked in every day because we are doing and progressing and putting out policies that are gonna progress this American justice system in a way in which you put yourself out there. And so if we don't, guess what ends up happening? They make an example out of you and then folks don't want to come behind you and do or, or have the, the, the courage to do what it is that we do every single day. And so, yes, get out here, understand who your local representative is, make sure you have data to support it, but also make sure that you're supporting the individuals that are they're putting their, their necks out on the line every single day to advance this mission and ensuring racial equity and, and, and ending mass incarceration in this country. 
I would just, I would just, I was going to say, I would just piggyback on, on Marilyn there, you know, and Miriam knows um, this is my, my little soapbox, which is that, um, you know, I've been doing some outreach um, to, uh, to our major city uh, police departments, because, you know, what I would really like to see is I would really like to see our chief public safety officers in, in police departments who are charged with protecting the public safety of their communities to also care about the data and evidence in the same way that I'm seeing um, our elected district attorneys in many cities care about data and evidence. Um, and so, you know, the <laughs> I've had I've had a little bit of success, but it's it's a hard road um, in in reaching out to departments and talking to them. But it's the same, you know, it's the it's the reaching out, building bridges, sharing information, getting elected DAs and their you know their major city chief in in the same room to talk about evidence and data to hear the same presentation from researchers. Um, and I've also started um, talking to judges, right? Um, our, our trial court judges to, again, it's the same kind of process of education because, you know, I don't think our, our elected district attorneys can't be just hung out there to dry all by themselves. It's, there's, there are multiple um, actors, individuals who are charged with protecting public safety in a community. And we need to make sure that we are, we are talking to and, and collaborating with and having that conversation with, with all of the decision makers in the community. I would also add, even in places where there isn't, there aren't conversations about decriminalization or you're not starting with elected officials or police departments for people in my position, ask questions about your study participants' exposure to police, their engagement in police, extrajudicial and sanctioned behaviors um, that they've experienced with cops. Ask if they're familiar with good Samaritan laws or, you know, drug homicide laws. Like you can create evidence outside of these relationships that is useful for hopefully future efforts on decrim. Thank, Thank you all of you. Um, so, I mean, so Susan, since you touched upon like drug induced homicide, for example, I, I'm just curious if anyone here has recommendations or if there's any plans to do research on alternatives for other drug offenses. I mean, we're talking about possession, uh, but there are, you know, hosts of other drug offenses. So is there any plan to do research on that? Or yeah, it looks like Anna is nodding. Yeah, I mean, we um, we're expanding our work to um, to now uh, cooperate with with seven district attorneys' offices, and one of the things we're hoping that we'll be able to find in in one of those locations is um, remember that the heart of our design is getting this as a random assignment to cases, right? Because we want to be able to make really really credible, powerful, compelling inferences, and and, and what happens is the more serious um, a charge is, the more likely it is that that case is going to be is not going to be handled by whichever most junior, <laughs> right, a reigning ADA is is on call that day. It's going to get escalated up to a more senior um, uh, ADA or or a more senior ADA or supervising ADA is going to be called in to consult. So we're we're hoping that we will find a jurisdiction where we can still get a research design because, and it's not just, um, you know, to your point, it's not just, um, you know, distribution or it's not just more serious drug charges. It's also violent charges, felony charges. We need to understand the impacts of, of alternative decisions for all of those different kinds of cases um, to go beyond, at least in our case, the findings that we have about nonviolent misdemeanors. Thank, thank you. you. Um, so I think we have about three or four minutes left. Miriam, did you want to add something? And then I can ask one final question. Go ahead. So, so the only thing I was going to add, uh, um, and I'm so glad that one of the questions raised the issue of drug-induced homicides, those prosecutions in many ways are tragedy um, added to tragedy. You know, a life was lost, and now there's this inevitable desire, I think it sort of goes back to Marilyn's comments about the autopilot we tend to fall into in our country. The autopilot is to find somebody to punish. And when the autopilot, when we see that tragic loss, loss of life is whom can we prosecute? 
what we inevitably are doing is discouraging people from doing what Good Samaritan laws seek to achieve, namely get help when somebody um, is overdosing. And so we will be putting out within the next couple of months an issue brief on the issue of drug-induced homicides. But I really think, again, that's an area where we can and we should be smarter about what we're doing. Thank you for that, Marian. Um, so I just have one final question, but I also want to just flag that Susan Sherman, um, the research that you all did was on non-prosecution or declined to prosecute for drug offenses, but also sex, sex work, um, correct? And so if there's, you know, any kind of, if you want to just add something Thanks. real Thanks quick about that. that focuses in a drug. <laughs> okay, Thank go ahead. You. Um, um, so, so we didn't, I didn't present all of our data today, except for the uh, recidivism. Um, there are many more in the state of Maryland, there are many more arrests for drug use than sex work because you have to catch a person in the act. It, you need to have a vice squad who there's like a sting. It's very archaic and the language is all very offensive. And of course, in many ways, transactional sex is really the footprint. I always think of like the patriarchy on the street and very linked to the drug economy. And so I think it's important when people are talking about drug, drug decrim to think about decrim for sex work as well, because it often disproportionately burdens, impacts people, um, you know, identified as who identify as women and uh, it's very closely related. So thank you for noting that. I think it's something important, even if the numbers aren't as high, it has similar kind of collateral damage on society. And the only other thing that I will add is that we didn't just come out and say, we're going to stop prosecuting these offenses and like, oh, well, you're on your own. We actually partnered with behavioral health organizations like Baltimore City Crisis Response Incorporated and sex worker organizations that could actually meet the needs of not only that individual, right, the behavioral health needs of that individual. So they're not just cycling in and out of the, the jail and ending up <laughs> like doing what we've always done that hasn't worked. But we also ensure that those we're meeting the needs of the community. And so we have these MOUs on record, but we could use a heck of a lot more. Right? I'm, I'm not the mayor's office, I'm the prosecutor's office. And so having those behavioral health services and an infusion of that of those types of services would really help to be able to decrease what is ultimately the behavioral health issues that we have criminalized for so long. Thank you so much. So, so I think we have one minute. So in like 15 seconds less, if you could just do a round really quickly, what do you hope uh, drug policy will move um, or progress to over the coming years? So just very quickly, just round robin. Where do you hope drug policy will move or progress to in the next, in the coming decade? Well, I'll just I'll just say, well, I hope that you know. Oh, oh Anna, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, I mean, this 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 is an obvious one for me. I mean, I I hope that it it it, it moves in the direction of substance abuse prevention and treatment as opposed to criminalization. Um, all right. Well, Susan, you unmuted. Did you want to add anything? No. Okay. Said. So I think we're, we've kind of come to the end. Um, and so I really want to thank you, one of you for your presentations and answering all of the questions. I think this was a really uh, dynamic conversation. So thank you all. Um, and for the audience, I just want to flag that we do have part two of this series happening next week. There were a few nuts and bolts. Uh, conversation questions about specifics of the policy. So I'd like to uh, encourage you all to join next week where you can hear from policy managers about how, how the policy got started and what the details are. So just a plug for that. And I think there are links in the chat for how to register for the future webinar. But thanks again uh, to every one of you. I'm most grateful for your time and levels. So take care. Bye-bye. Thank you all.